Okay, well, it looks like uh, we have most everybody here. Welcome, glad to see you all. Um, we are heading back in to uh, some of the most uh, uh, intense technical stuff that Hamming did. And, and today we're gonna cover uh, first coding theory, uh, the two chapters there, 10 and 11. And then we're gonna go into, uh, in the second half of today's session, we'll go into forward error correction. And that, uh, that episode, as you've probably figured out from watching it and reading it is one of the most intense sessions uh, because it plays on so many levels at once. It's got uh, him and talking about the technology, it, it, starting with the discovery of uh, the problem, understanding the problem, then considering ways to deal with the problem, then going all the way to uh, possible solutions and unraveling it to multiple dimensions. So um, if all that weren't enough, he describes how making him famous changed how he did business, but not in a way you might expect brought him back to his roots of what was he studying? How did he diversify? How did he learn to learn so that he might make more contributions and not just live off uh, his laurels or look at uh, uh, ways to be Mr. Ford error correcting forever. So interesting sessions today. Let's start with uh, just some of our uh, mechanics and uh, course structures. Um, uh, welcome, Sinker, glad you made it. We are starting on, uh, let's get a screen share going here. Uh, let's try again. There we go. Okay, uh, you should be seeing the class homepage, but I'm not sure if that's correct. Or, or what? What are you guys seeing? Yeah, class homepage. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Zoom saves all of its uh, surprises for me right during the class session. Of course, it saves most of the other times. All right, so here was the email you got. So it should be nothing new here, but uh, it'd be a good setup. We do have some progress on the website. I've made some uh, progress on YouTube with uh, our prior settings uh, of uh, lectures together, basically course discussions, not lectures. And so see we've got headers and footers and uh, it just goes right into it. So if you missed class or you want to uh, uh, just look at what somebody said again. That's cool. Uh, hey, that's me. All right. We had another person join. Welcome, Lauren. Uh, okay. Oop, look at that. There's Toby right up there. Okay. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and for good measure, uh, even have a footer on the end of it. Um, um, and add an update to the video software. So that's, that's all good. Um, that means our uh, sessions are achieving one of our goals for this quarter, where we could leave behind the dialogue uh, so that others can maybe take the course on their own and still have some of that give and take that occurs. Because uh, uh, Hopefully every one of us is getting a lot out of it from uh, other points of view, other concepts, uh, other reactions to, to what Hanning's putting out there. Okay. Uh, 
Next up is uh, Project Plants, hoping to discuss what you all want to do. And uh, Bert, thanks for, for your mail. Would you care to uh, lead us off on, on what you think you would like to do this quarter and what you hope to get out of the course? Sure. Give me a second. And uh, Bert, and everybody else stand by because as uh, pointed out in the message, uh, your turn is coming real soon now. Let's, uh, let's share our ideas together. Please go ahead, Bert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, this is the email I wrote and I sent to Don for the question what I expect from the course and why um, did I choose this course and uh, what chapter I'd like to moderate. So um, at first, I have I have never, totally never heard about uh, Mr. Hemming uh, before. Yeah, Don. No, that's good. That's good. Okay, okay. Yeah. So keep going. Uh, keep going. To, to, um, so I did a short research uh, in, in uh, the internet. I googled Mr. Hemingway and I found some YouTube videos, especially Hemming Five, was it, where he said something like, "Yeah, uh, be patient with the old guys, and uh, nobody can say, hey, they did everything wrong. This is the reason why they are there, where she, where they are. Um, they did it." a uh, uh, long time ago and maybe it was the right decision there but it isn't the right decision or the right way to do the same today or it, will, it won't be the right decision to do this in further and I, I think um, everything he saw he said the brief research I did was kind of interesting but often a little bit funny and he was mostly right so in my opinion so i said okay this is interesting i've never heard before um, about mr hemingway and this is the reason i always um, choose uh, topics or problems or something like this if i don't know about it i choose it and i will learn so this is the reason why i choose um, quantum mechanics as my topic or chapter which i'd like to uh, discuss on the 24th i think yeah 24th and uh the, the reason for it, I don't know um, a lot about quantum mechanics. So I choose quantum mechanics to uh, learn a little bit more and to introduce uh, the chapter with uh, the help of Hemming. Yeah, done. Anything else? No, I was just applauding here. Wow, quantum mechanics. Uh, oh. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. I, I said, so sorry. I, uh, <clears throat> I said Hemingway. Hemingway, now, of course, um, I read sometimes about Hemingway, but I mean Mr. Heming. Totally Heming, not Hemingway. My, my apologies. <laughs> That's great. That's great. As a, a corollary to that uh, Heming attitude, he used to say, uh, there's two kinds of people in the world. People who keep their office doors shut and people who keep their office doors yeah. open. Yeah. And the and ones that keep it open are the ones trying to learn. So. Yeah. It's a so thank you, Bert. The mind of, the, of this person. If the door is shut, the mind is also, hmm, how can I say, not open. So, and I, I like this metaphor. Absolutely, sir. Outstanding. Uh, uh, you mentioned in there about uh, some of the transcript, transcription, too, and uh, Michelle, with the, would that be a good segue to you, Michelle? Uh, what's your thinking on, uh, you've already shown us some good stuff here. Uh, how about that transcription? Yeah, I, I definitely, I got emails from at least three members of the class this week, all of which wanted to participate. Um, at, and at a minimum, they wanted to do the chapters that they were gonna be presenting, which I think is a great idea. Um, but I think as far as a project, um, if I could get everybody to do maybe, um, uh, you know, just like, I don't know what the right number is, um, Don, and I guess I'll come back to you to determine what the right number might be for a, you know, project, how many transcripts might they want to do, 
Um, I did just this week, I did all of 10 um, as, I, as I was prepping for class this week. Um, I already did 10 and I did half of 11. So just in, you know, and now I've got it down to where it's like a four hour project to do one transcript rather than the eight hours, which was, it took me a long time the first time through. So um, that's really up to you as far as kind of what you would consider a project to be, I think. But I, I will take, I mean, it, this could be a class project and we could just try to knock out as many of them as we could. I mean, that would be fine by me, but it's up to you. Cool. Well, uh, uh, easy answer just got easier. Thanks for that uh, hard work on your part, Michelle. I'd say the minimum, everybody should do the transcript for their chapter. And if you're not doing it, you should review it for clarity and correctness because you're already focused on that chapter and, and what it should mean. Second, uh, um, uh, if it makes sense, keep going, do some more. Uh, I see this as, uh, uh, unless you get it down to a 100.0, I, I, even then I think it'll probably be a recurring activity for students in the class to say, well, did we get it right? Did we hear it right? Sometimes it's phrasing is a little interesting. And uh, uh, as part of the, Number three, as part of the, how do we perpetuate hamming and going? I assume success, then what? There's a good heuristic. Let's assume we get to 100% success on the transcripts. They're all polished. They're all searchable. They're all good. How do we translate that? Should we translate that? Should we put it in German? Should we put it in another language? Uh, I just see this as one of the perennial topics in the course. Uh, I'm not, I did not say just sit down, do that. I said, hmm, interesting. What if we did have subtitles in other languages for his course, if that aided clarity? Uh, I don't know the answers to that, but I, I suspect it's a pretty good question. So Michelle, thank you. And uh, uh, you could also uh, either put the students to work or as, as either writers or editors on what's the write up on how to do the transcription process. I know you already have some uh, serious ideas already about how to describe that. So um, um, I forget if Hamming said this, please somebody tell me if they've seen it in the lectures, but uh, there is yeah, an old but... slogan, uh, eating your own dog food everybody know that one eating your own dog food that's where you know somebody's there going oh yeah this is great stuff you'll love it it's the best dog food ever made and and somebody says but do you eat it and it's the the practice of going through what you're espousing and actually walking the walk it often leads to insight so uh i don't know if that's a hammingism or just another colloquial but uh that's uh, walking a, the walk, uh, being practitioners is part of it. I, I've never heard it uh, done. That's that's a mid nineteen seventies Alpo commercial. Warren Green ah. and his uh, red <laughs> Irish setter. Can and a can been, a blog entry be uh, far behind? It's been picked <laughs> up heavily by Silicon Valley as a way of saying we use our own software. Cheers. Okay, any questions for Michelle on uh, transcripts? So, yeah, so Don, just for everybody, and then Michelle, I'll take questions in a minute. Um, the, you know, my plan was to kind of be able to talk about it today when we got to this, this part of uh, today's lecture, but if you are definitely interested in participating and want to um, take part, just let me know. Um, and then I'm going to send an email out a little later today with the, uh, you know, with the initial guidance and where you can find the transcripts and how we're going to track who's working on what so we're not duplicating the effort because that's at mm -hmm. this point I'd like to avoid duplicating efforts as much as possible. That's great. Why don't we, uh, 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 if you could share that email and let everybody absorb it, then when we do it on video, it'll be peppier. We'll get right to the heart of things. So thank you, Michelle. Uh, we got some material to cover today, so I think we should uh, power on through. So that'll be a good uh, production topic to lead off with next week.
the mechanics of transcription. Okay, who's next? Who else would like to talk about what they hope to get from the course and maybe what chapter you're going to do? Yeah, I can get that, sir. Uh, so I know we talked briefly at the very beginning of this course, but as we've dived, dove into this a little bit deeper, kind of what's motivated me on this was understanding how to manage research and address problems. Cause as Hamming continues to talk about looking at the problems, are we looking at the right type, types of problems? That's kind of been a lot of the big takeaway that I've been getting. And then for me personally, learning from just the great minds of science and industry has always been something that's pretty interesting. So being able to listen to and watch and read the different lectures and write-ups from Hamming, you know, some of that helped create the atomic bomb in the 1940s with 1940s technology and countries these days are still struggling with, with that technology is just super fascinating to me. Um, in terms of looking at projects, uh, and we emailed back and forth a little bit, uh, chapter 18 needs to get the kind of digested down to the slides and coursework. So I've been going through the videos and the write-ups on that one. And Professor Eisenhower, I, since I'm going through all that as well, I'm more than willing to start working that transcription for chapter 18 as well. So I can uh, double tag that, get both the slides and some transcriptions done. Great. Now, what's that topic, John, chapter 18? Simulation. It's simulations one. And that's Very a topic good. that I've just scratched the surface on here at school. So it's a, cool. it's a good one to dive into. Outstanding. And a uh, uh, production note on that, or for maybe the next person, uh, uh, chapter 20, simulation three. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for detecting we had a problem with the video. I've been pulling the string on that. Uh, the source that we uploaded to YouTube was somehow duplicated wrong. And uh, so I don't have that in high res. I think I have simulation three in lower res uh, somewhere in my archive. So the, the journey continues and uh, when we regain access to campus and the videotapes, which I guess I'm happy to say are safely preserved in the Hamming archive, we'll, uh, we'll uh, break the lead seal on the box and uh, fish it out and recode it again. Also notice that uh, you probably guys probably noticed two chapters uh, 10 and 11 coding theory one and two, the audio is out of sync. Uh, yeah, I, I went back to the source I had and the auto is out of sync there. So I'm going to, I'm going to test that shiny new video tool I have and uh, rather than wait for access to the VHS tapes, I'm going to see if I can't uh, use that tool to shift right accumulator on the uh, audio and, and get it aligned with the video. Okay, who, who would like to talk next about their goals for this quarter? Did my talk from last week count or do you want me to talk about it again? Well, since you're all in a row, why don't you go ahead, Toby, just the short form, because this will be a nice block on the video. Okay. Um, I'm gonna uh, do a deep dive into you got what you measure. Um, because um, you, you talked me into this topic by saying how great this would be to put it in my math thesis. So I read this chapter and say, okay, um, that's a good topic. And after reading it, I think it's a pretty good topic for all NPS professors um, to get a bell-shaped curve uh, as uh, class grades for their classes. So every professor before teaching uh, should read it. Um, I will also do the transcript for it. And yeah, what will I get out of this class? Hopefully a little less work than we would have to do with system engineering because this is our supplement class for a class we dropped. And we thought this is a, a very good, how do you say it? A very good exit to get uh, rid of a class you don't like and uh, enter into a class you actually could take anything out of it. Thank you for uh, favoring a prepared mind. Who's next? Hey, sir. Uh, Please, Marty. 
I'm hey, sorry, I, I saw the hand raised. Marty, go ahead. Uh, thanks, real quick. Um, my purpose is a little selfish, having just about completed three years of work on hamming. I'm very much interested in other people's reactions 40 years or 20 years after I saw him do things and saw him write things, how other people perceive him and what attributes of hamming are not clear in the literature uh, that maybe I'll pick up in some of my lectures. Very good. Thank you, Marty. And uh, um, on that note, let me uh, share a screen here. And here we go. Thanks uh, for sending this this morning. Uh, uh, these are excerpts from your uh, your biography, Dr. Mandelberg. Biography of Dr. Hannon. Is this coming through? We can see it. Okay, so uh, I think I think what you sent me, and please uh, uh, improve this abstract, is uh, five different videos that are online that you found that talked about gaming, and you've already done uh, abstracts here. So these are references that we could cross-link on the website. Is is that correct? Sorry, I'm not hearing you. Uh, thanks, Don. I was on mute. Uh, what I've sent through are uh, links to six videos that Hamming appeared in most of them. Uh, IBM and AT&T in the 60s decided that the common person needed to understand or start to not fear and understand what this thing called a computer was. So they did uh, an hour long uh, episodes on public broadcast uh, out of San Francisco, KQED, and IBM picked a number of professors, uh, very distinguished, and Richard Wesley Hemming from Bell Labs. And uh, over the couple of months, he started to improve his style in front of the camera uh, but he was describing in a very clear way that most people weren't used to what it was to have a computer, what it could do, what's the future. It wasn't a sales pitch for IBM. It was to tell people there's now something new and um, uh, you might be interested to see. They're dated because it's in the 60s version of computers. You're going to see tape drives and really, really old IBM stuff. But the words I thought were useful. Thank you very much, Marty. Seems like a real find. Okay, so you guys will see that online and you'll also see, uh, uh, hopefully real soon now, we'll have br abstracts briefings to accompany Dr. Uh, Mandelberg's two talks already. So uh, we've discussed dates uh, for when we could uh, hand the podium to uh, Marty here to go through his things. So uh, I'm wondering if we should go for the 8th or the 15th uh, of this month, in one week or in two weeks. Uh, and that's maybe a student question more than anybody. Marty, I know you're ready, but for everybody else, uh, he has two videos online. He has some work on the biography. Uh, is next week enough time for you to prepare to be ready for his uh, talk, or would you rather wait two weeks? I think personally, next week works for me because um, I mean, I just see this, we just push the other topics forward one week, right? Correct. Everybody good? Uh, not hamming, but a slogan that you may find useful. Silence equals assent. And the silence has it. Thank you, John. We'll go next week. Uh, Marty, we'll see you then. Um, okay, and I'll update the schedule to match.
Okay, anybody else? Uh, we had somebody else ready to talk about their project. Hey, sir, uh, Lieutenant Commander Mike Orfini here. Um, you know, I didn't really know what to expect um, when I signed up for this class. I came into it about a week late, but uh, from reading the syllabus, and um, I did read a book, you know, about 10, five years ago called Megatrends from 1988 by John Naisbitt. It was really interesting that I was able to kind of see a lot of the things that he uh, picked up on in his book, you know, kind of relating to today. And as we kind of what Marty was saying, as we, we look at Hamming, I'm, I'm interested to see you know, how correct or how um, on point, if you will, he was with, with what he, you know, put out um, multiple years ago. And, you know, how can this translate to us predicting, you know, ways that the military can, um, can be ready for the, the future fight, um, however, you know, it, in whatever length of time. So I, again, I didn't really uh, know what to expect. I, I really appreciate the different way of thinking. A lot of this is uh, I'm a business uh, MBA, getting my MBA here in my last quarter, and it's just a different way to, to look at things. And uh, I appreciate what I'm picking up so far. Uh, my project, I was going to uh, uh, go with what Michelle was uh, putting out and transcribe my creativity at Traptor and whatever else is needed. Over. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, sounds great, Mike, and uh, we're very glad to have you, of course. And uh, for all of you, as part of having a prepared mind, most of you are writing a thesis right now. Most of you might have some future project or future work that you're thinking about, thinking through. Uh, when inspiration strikes, grab it, write that down, say, well, what am I thinking? What am I doing here? How do some of the ideas in this course fit together and prepare me? Um, so uh, to me, that's the gold ring on this course is uh, if you can get a section uh, motivation in your thesis or potential impact or the meaning of it all, then that's a, that's a great thing. Anybody else care to speak today? Okay, then let's get into uh, uh, the chapter. Let's see if we took care of all the business. Uh, Yeah, I think so. Uh, I will talk next about the chapter we didn't do in order. And uh, that's kind of interesting, actually. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to swap these two. And notice uh, how if three were too many, then five is maybe too many, too many. We, we've relaxed the constraint of drilling down into every chapter, but what I am going to try to do is distill the high points out of those in one lecture, because there's a lot of diversity here. We've added some scope. I want to make sure we're going where it best suits the needs of everybody here. So I did move down chapter nine to proceed uh, mathematics. What's uh, interesting about chapter nine, I think when you do look at it is, uh, First of all, it's, it starts pretty benignly. It's algebra, and it builds up from there into gradually into higher and higher level uh, concepts. And I, I can tell you back in the day when we were taking this course, when I was in groups taking this course, uh, it was kind of like, oh, my God, why are we here with all this math? And it was very clear reviewing the error-correcting codes that, this was a part of the mosaic, the set of pieces that Hamming needed to build toward error correction codes. So we wanted everybody to have that. So we see that, okay, once you get past single levels of code, single error detection, single error correction, how do you generalize that in the large? He wasn't going to uh, the universe of n dimensions uh, somewhere far beyond outer space. No, it was mathematical. How do we keep scaling out and uh, as a way of thinking, applying mathematic techniques that uh, many of you are already quite familiar with. So that's interesting. We'll get to it later. I wanted to give you that preview now, just because this topic, n-dimensional space, was 
a fundamental influencer in uh, Hamming's thinking about error correcting codes and then uh, forward error correction. Okay, so uh, next is, uh, well, let's get into it, coding theory. There's, uh, there's a lot here and it can seem uh, pretty dense, uh, densely written at times if you're not uh, a double E major, <laughs> for example. But uh, uh, that's okay. This is uh, pretty fundamental uh, to lots of science. And it struck me this time around, uh, a point I wanted to bring out to you guys is, it's it, the amazing thing about the chapters is not how much detail there is, but quite the opposite. It tends to be, how was he able to condense it? to take so much and put it in there and get the, the top level nuggets out of it. Uh, here's a book I'm putting on the screen. This is uh, a book we've mentioned before. Uh, the book that Shannon didn't write. Okay, where Hanning for years begged him to, people must know about what you're doing. And, uh, uh, and I, I don't know if I can use Hamming's exact words, but essentially it um, it irritated him enough that he said, well, if he won't write it, then I will write it. It's his work, uh, but I, I, I have to get this out there. Okay, so when you go through this uh, interesting book and uh, you look at it and you go, oh, oh, the skeleton of portion, large portions of this book are the lecture you're watching that. So when he is sampling the information about information theory, it's really based on quite a lot of work uh, already. And so it's a highly informed selection distillation. And if we think of ourselves maybe as, uh, well, I don't know about archeologists, someday archeologists, but uh, computer uh, historians right now, or theory of how do things work, all that details there. Okay, so that's reassurance. So let's uh, let's get into the chapter a little bit more now. Um, uh, here's the same problem in the small every time we do an abstract. How do you take a giant big thing and squeeze it down more and more and more and more to each level so that you have the condensation of it? Okay, now this is a, this is a, frankly, a, a challenge each and every one of you is facing right now, writing your thesis or writing a paper or whatever your work is. And it's an interesting one because the key is not how do you say everything about everything in fewer words? But it's how do you communicate enough so that readers will recognize where it's going, will understand the basic import of it, will get influenced in a way that you as the author want. Okay. So, uh, uh, you can see what Hanning did not do was give abstracts to each of his chapters, right? So when we go through the notes there on the left, uh, there's no abstract. Sorry, am I sharing the screen properly? Are you guys getting it? No, oh, we're not oh. your screen. screen sharing gap. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so there's a human encoding error. How about now? Yes, we can see it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, seeing the lectures. All right, so let me recap that briefly. Here's his lecture. Here it is written. Here's the link to the video. Here's the abstract. 
how do you distill an abstract to say everything that's there? How do you distill a chapter to tell everything that's there? There's a whole book there. There's a whole book that is actually the distillation of the whole major uh, uh, corpus of Claude Shannon. Okay, so we're at least three, four, maybe five orders of magnitude of distillation. And how do you go from something so big, far impactful, to the gist of it? I, I recommend to you, you always think of the reader. Use the reader point of view as your focus for what needs to be said. So what does a reader need to know? Well, where were we? What are we doing? Representation of information. How do we do it in a way that we can process it? And then a few more things. And oh, by the way, if we're done, we end up with meaning, not just data. The purpose of computing is insight. So you can see this abstract was not written by Hammond. He did not give us abstracts in his chapters, but it is our best attempt to say, what do we got here? And why should you read it? And why should you interest it? Okay. Uh, uh, interesting challenge. How are we doing? Making sense out there? Quick poll, including those not on camera. Uh, how many people found that are finding that the abstracts for the chapters are preparing you for what, what are we going to see next? Or how many think that they're just so foreign that uh, it's really hard to get engaged? Any, any reaction there? This is Zinker um, calling from Tucson, Raytheon Missiles and Dispense. I, I appreciate the abstracts um, because they help me save my time and prepare me um, to, to, to think ahead and have the right uh, mind frame as I work. Over. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I don't know. Really Marty. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry, Toby. I'll, I'll yeah, go ahead. Having being older by a factor two than almost everyone in this room except uh, Don. Um, and have written probably 200 reports, articles, publications. An abstract is the first thing you write and the last thing you write when you write an article. It's your vision of how you're going to tell people um, your, the points you're trying to make. And then when you read it, you go back and you change it. It's an art form to learn how to do, but it's extremely valuable. Cheers. Toby, please. Um, I, I uh, never noticed that they are abstracts because <laughs> I go into the, um, into the chapter and then just jump into the PDF and read the whole PDF. Uh, until now, as you told us, there is an abstract. I never read them. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, uh, all good. Uh, so two, two more bonus takeaways on this topic. Uh, um, if you walk by a problem, you own it. <laughs> you really stone part of it. So if you go in here and you see some, and you go, oh, okay, this will be interesting. And then the chapter turned out to be quite different than one of the expectations you had. <gasps> good, good. We want to know that. There's only one chance to make a first impression. So while it's fresh in your mind, if you see something that, you know, what did you mention that uh, you saw world hunger in there? Oh, okay, yeah, maybe we should. Uh, 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 please uh, help us improve it. Those abstracts are not locked in stone. And then uh, uh, here's one more thing. We used to have uh, a metric. We used to have no metrics for this. 
Okay. Uh, uh, now there are some secondary metrics. You could say what is attracting interest, but you don't know that till long after the fact. What things are getting hits and and uh, um, eyeballs, I guess they call it. So uh, here's a metric. If I search for a topic, will I find this asset? Okay, and so therefore, you do want to put keywords, key acronyms, other searchable terms in the abstract so that they're locatable. I offer that to you as, that's a metric for writing your thesis right now. Uh, that's why the titles of chapters, the captions of figures are so important. And it can seem kind of vague and abstract if you're just writing. But then if you say, oh, okay, my fellow student who shows up the day after I leave and wants to know about such and such a topic, will they find all the work I put in here? Will they, will they read this page? Will they see this picture? That's measurable. That's measurable. And it's not just measurable by you sitting at your desk. It's measurable by you going, hey, hey, Joan, hey, Fred. Does this make sense? Can you find it? Or how would you express this question and hear what words they say and do the search? See what you get. Looking good? Okay, so pressing on. Uh, John? Go ahead, Marty. Yeah, uh, people, if you have, bring up your group chat, I gave a link to a very good article on how to write an abstract and in brief form, a good abstract lets the reader know that your paper is worth reading. It's like a cover letter to your resume or an opening of a good report. Um, a good abstract should be brief, but packed with information. What is it? When I read a lot, what I often do is capture the abstract, put it in a book. Because if I've read 50 books or 100 books, and I said, where did I find that? or what was the important point? I usually shrink it down to a single page, keep a, uh, a word file of the abstract. Uh, when you're doing your research, when I did my doctoral research at Monterey in uh, my research phase was the end of 1978, we didn't have personal computers. I went to the Dudley Knox Library and Xerox copied over a thousand articles and then reduce them to three by five cards. If the article didn't have a good abstract, I had to bring it down to a point before I could write the chapter in my thesis of what's the state of the knowledge, because your thesis is advancing knowledge. And there's no way you can keep a thousand clear in your head, but putting them on a three by five card, if you can't summarize an article in five sentences, you, it's not a good article or you don't understand. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Barney. And for all you, you young people, the bonus takeaway there is not just, thank God I don't have to do that anymore, but it's, oh, I could do that if I had to. I could do it. So you, you've been warned. You're, you are armed. You're going to get some more of that. Okay, question. Are you seeing the full screen slide? Putting the Okay, thumbs up. On we go. Um, we're we're going to cherry pick. We're going to sample some of these things. Too much to cover. Listen to him and go through it yourself. Read it yourself. But I'll pop out on some things that are cool. And, and maybe pose it for you in case it didn't quite gel. The representation of information is sounds so innocent, but is so powerful. And even today, people have trouble with this thing, uh, uh, even experts. And um, here we're saying, uh, what are the codes that matter? No, just what you. are the messages that matter? I'm sorry, go ahead. We're saying, if we pick a vocabulary of messages that matter, how do we communicate them? How do we pass them back and forth? And the primary motivator 
at least for Shannon and all this work, was how to do it in a theoretical way so that electrical signals or data bits could capture, represent, transfer that. Okay, but Hamming takes it to another level and that's pretty interesting. And uh, uh, the communication is, can we send the uh, menu for noon meal? Can we send the temperature and the weather report? Yeah. Can it be understood? Mm, maybe. Are there common terms of reference? Is there a dictionary? Uh, can it arrive safely at the far side of wherever that is? Uh, um, that depends on the coding information and then encoding it to go over a wire and then go back. And then he, he points out the example of, well, if somebody describes something and you go home and describe it to your, your spouse or a friend, then do they understand what you heard? Do you understand what you heard? There's a, there's a part of the game that uh, some of you might have played in, uh, I don't know, grade school or something where uh, uh, five people go out of the room and the first one comes in and the teacher says, okay, here's a little story. And uh, it might be the story of Mary had a little lamb. And, and, and then say, okay, now you tell the next person. They get some version of that. And then you get the next person. And then by the time you get four or five people, everybody's roaring because the story is nothing like what it was when it first was relayed. Have any of you played that, that little game before? I guess I had a much more exciting uh, grade school than you guys did. I, I don't know. Okay, well, think about it. Well, we, we anyway, uh, uh, it's a very real thing. And actually, I know you're all familiar with it because as leaders, uh, everyday question is, what do I tell my people to do? Because what you say and what happens might be very different. And the mark of a good leader is how do they express it in terms, measurable terms, that everybody can say, oh, I know what to do. And they go off and do the right thing. Okay, so uh, Think about it in those terms. And how do we get from big ideas to medium ideas to data words and alphabets, okay? So uh, if you wanna see a, a studied exercise in diplo diplomacy, re read Hamming's words and listen to how he pulls his punches. He holds back on saying, oh my God, it's the worst name in the world. No, he doesn't, he says, there's been no end of regret and confusion by calling it information theory instead of communication theory. <laughs> he lets you be the judge. So this is all about communication of something from a source to a sink, from a originator to a destination. How do we get that message through? And its primary is through computer mediated means the secondary is, oh, by the way, are, are we talking yet? Are you making sense? So let's keep going. He extrapolates on this. Uh, going down into the fundamentals of it is important. Physics, physics models. Uh, how many of the equations that you learn in physics in high school and in college and in your training had noise in them? had error in them. Let's, let's guess a percent. Greater than 10% or less than 10%? You think higher, Marty? Higher? Well, you must have you, you must have went to a noise major, you know, signaling. Errors are rarely considered in, in equations because they're trying to teach the theory. In theory, theory and practice in the same. In practice, they're not. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of error. There's stuff you don't expect. We're unable to measure 
exactly the quantities we want, we have to deal with that experimental error somehow. Go ahead, please. Well, I think there's a different interpretation there. The equation is the equation. The equation isn't where error comes from. The error comes from having measured observations of the things you put into the equation. And Hamming talks about that kind of measurement error quite a bit. And when they teach physics, they talk about the measurement error and the totals of the measurement errors. But the equation, if you had perfect measurement, you would get those numbers. I think that, that's, that's, where it come, that's where it works out. Good way of saying it. Anyone else? Don? Please grab the mic if nobody's talking. Thanks. Uh, I understand about measurement error, but Hamming would admit there's another type of error. An equation is man's creation to try to describe something in the physical world we live in. Under certain conditions, it's even valuable. Most equations are not time invariant. We think they are. Oh, I learned this back in school, that this is how you calculate that. You change some of the assumptions or the world changes. Pollution can affect optics. We might have designed a system 40 years ago, but then you put pollution between your sensor and the object, and all of a sudden, things are fuzzy. That's error. An equation is an attempt to describe something at a certain point of time with certain assumptions. That is not time invariant. Okay, great. Let's keep pushing on. Here's the human component. He talks back, it's a small component of the chapter, but it's significant that he poses them side by side because that's rarely done. And then uh, uh, say, well, let's keep focused on the bits. We know how to go bits. And uh, hardware costs money. Gee, maybe we can get smarter. And maybe our coding theory can help us when the hardware is insufficient, when the measurement is difficult, when the medium is uh, not cooperating. Okay, and uh, this next point is also unusual, at least unusual today. Uh, today, everybody's used to the internet everywhere, so we've all been sort of uh, quantized, discretized to fix them out. So oh, we talk about bytes and computer words and what are packet lengths, and we have ASCII codes for characters. So there's a lot of conventions now about how do we digitally represent information? Well, it doesn't have to be fixed length binary bit alphabets. When you go variable length, you actually get a lot of flexibility. And what he's talking about here is the ability to start from a completely blank board and say, what are the words and terms that we need to pass along? And then how do I do just those symbols? Okay, and if I do, to, do it right, it's unambiguous, it's unique, and it's also instantaneous. You can read it without having to do a second pass. Okay, so here's an example of failing unique. Uh, uh, if this didn't make sense, start from the bottom. What is S1, S2, S4? Okay, that's a zero, zero again, one, one. Zero, zero, one, one. Okay, now what's S2, S4? Zero, zero, one, one. Oh, it's ambiguous. There's two different ways of saying the exact same thing, just down at the bit level, okay? And uh, not a good code, not a good code. Not if you wanna have any kind of clarity or repeatability. So what are the rules for that? He walks through it. Uh, you have to make your Thinking at a binary level, distinguish them, disambiguate them. And oh, by the way, it's good to know when you're done. 
when no more data is coming rather than the line just went dead. Okay, so here he is showing just how simple it really is at that fundamental level. If we don't know how long our symbol is, we don't have the flexibility or the, the comfort of knowing that we have eight bytes, but rather we're going to keep reading bits until we go, okay, it's done. And now we are uh, 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 finished. Here's one code. And uh, notice how this is not a pure binary code, but this is these symbols. Okay, and then uh, a four symbol code going uh, back. Notice it, uh, well, it's, yeah, you can see it here. Okay, these are three bits, these are three, oh, but this is a two bit symbol. And this is a one bit symbol. So how do you disambiguate? Well, he's saying, look for the one, one, ones, and then go backwards. So that's curious because then you could say, I know where, I know what that is unambiguously, and I can keep going backwards to disambiguate this from that, from the other. Okay. So you have to first accept them all and then work backwards to parse it not instantaneous. Okay, uh, uh, God bless math, there are actually people who've uh, done theorems, meaning provable things. Say, well, what is goodness? What do we care about? Well, we'd like to get the most out of our channel, so if we can reduce our representations to fewer bits, that's good. Oh, so what is he saying here? All I'm saying is if you send some messages more often than others, use fewer bits for them. That's how you pick the key to that message. So the frequent stuff is more easily parsed. The rare stuff is the longer stuff. And then it works. And then he marches us through the math on that. And the probability for a given code times the number of bits it has. Oh yeah, I remember these are multiple bit codes. See, they're the variable length encoding. There's our overall and there's our average length. And oh, and if we say we get to one in this equation, then we have a perfect code. There's no wasted space in the representation. You can keep pushing on the math and even on the theories and um, I recommend that. Hamming didn't force everybody, but do the best you can. It's always, uh, uh, unlike some of the, you mathematician folks, it's a, it's a challenge for me. I always have to take a deep breath, but uh, it's worth trying to track these equations because it's not so much, what exactly was that subscript there? It's more, what are the relationships we're talking about here? How do they proceed? And then Hamming's next step is, this is what it means. Oh, if it's less than one, you may be able to do something shorter. If it's exactly one, you're done. You won't, you won't squeeze any more information in there. There's no space left to take advantage of. Oh, so that's a measure, whether your code is useful or not. It's also a comparison metric for different codes of similar things and whether or not they're good. Okay, let's pop up beyond the variable length encoding of bits to, what are we talking about? And I uh, already gave these examples. Uh, oh, but it gets worse. The words don't always mean the same thing. You're saying something very clear. Will your people hear what you're saying? Are the words you're saying matching what you're thinking? Is what you're thinking actually matching what you want to occur? This is why, for example, in many military communities that you folks are part of, there are standard order vocabularies. And nobody's allowed to put on a headset or receive, much less give an order, unless they know the vocabulary, so that we can talk here. Here's an able example. All ahead full. What does that mean? 
Well, it, it, it could vary from ship to ship, but everybody in the control room knows what that means for that ship because they're qualified in that vocabulary. So that's great for the military that has some option to do discipline, but how do you get beyond that when everybody's words can vary? And uh, uh, if we try to balance that then, we end up with, uh, Oh, the characteristics of the machines and the pure bits and the characteristics of the humans have some overlaps, but they're different. So he points out, this is the same AI question. What could we do together to maximize this? Questions on coding theory, points on coding theory, please. Are we seeing the screen? Back to the okay, screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, if we go down, you'll see I've left you as promised uh, last week and as threatened in the uh, email, uh, you've got the course questions. Okay, so uh, these are the questions I think pull you into the, some of the key concepts there. Uh, please answer them. Please don't answer them like a test. Please add an answer that hasn't been given before that you think is part of that solution. Okay. So, uh, Toby, here's an unrehearsed moment. What do you think this first question means? We talked about this a lot during our thesis sessions. Um, you always come up with a stream is a stream is a stream whether in rest or in motion. So it doesn't matter, we have um, information available. Um, if it's in, in rest, we have to store it in, uh, in a file to save it for later. And if we put it on the wire, we can just uh, send it from here to there. So it, the, the, the transmission of the information is nearly the same um, from here to there as it is from now to then. Hopefully that clarifies it a little bit. Great. See how easy that was, everybody? And there are more answers to that. Uh, 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 let's say the message is, the menu for noon meal is cheeseburgers. How many symbols do we need for that? Roughly. Menu for new meal is cheeseburgers. You could Did you, use if I handed you a slip of paper that said menu, noon, meal, cheeseburgers, would you know whether to go to the galley on the ship or not? Yeah. Probably. Okay. And then uh, uh, you could say, oh, that's a four symbol message. But how many symbols do we need? Well, how many items are on the menu? How many meals are there in a day? How do we preface it with the term menu versus don't eat? The vocabulary will be a little bit bigger but it won't be infinite. So you can say, well, I don't know, I go through the menu for a week or even a month, it starts repeating. So I don't know, how many items are on the menu? A hundred? Anybody here been a supply officer? If not today, there will be in the future. Well, uh, if you tell the Plaster. Good news. I've got a thousand menu items for your crew to serve. Do you have a happy supply officer or a sad supply officer? Sorry, Michelle. What was that? I said probably a very sad supply officer. Yeah, or, or uh, get out of my kitchen supply officer. <laughs> 
Never piss off the cook. Oops, sorry, I misspoke there. Uh, uh, okay, so our choice of vocabulary and big is good, is important, and squeezing it down is good. And how many do you use, and what does it mean? Oh, okay. So let's look at these questions again and substitute the menu for a noon meal is cheeseburgers. Is that something that should be spoken versus something that should be saved in the plan of the day versus something that can be pulled up on your calendar? There's an example. Here's another example. How big's my vocabulary? Am I trying to do the entire English language or the entire lexicon of cooking or the strict strictly bounded set of ingredients that are allowed. Okay, so those are ways to answer that question. Please lean on your own experience understanding. Please don't hesitate to pose it as a further question, but I know each and every one of you have dealt with these issues, though you may not have realized it before. Okay, any questions on the question? Sir, for that second Great. question, how are we doing? Sir, yeah. for that second question, is it m more related to the like in terms of defining and encoding of breaking it down into its different parts? Because Hamming met talks about like the source encoding and the channel encoding and, and some basic methodology behind those versus are we defining and encoding for a vocabulary? Because if the process is Define, then it's, it doesn't really matter what the vocabulary that's coming in. You use your determined process, whether it's alphabetic symbols or numbers or formulas, and you process that. I guess that's kind of more of a question. Yes, yes. Welcome to the problem space. Yes. And it plays on both ways. It plays on what is the set of messages we want to represent and send over the wire. And it also is what happens when we send it over the wire or put it in storage and pull it out again? Are we losing anything? And if putting it in storage sounds like you can never lose something, well, please put that in the storage on your unmanned air vehicle and send it over the horizon. You might lose that thing. Okay, so these principles are pretty universal. Other reactions? Okay, uh, we've got two pretty interesting lectures to go through. Shall we take a short break right now, five minutes, let's say, and then pound through them at full speed, or uh, do you want to tackle another one right now? Okay, we got a take five, two take fives, the two yeses have it first. Yeah. Okay, we'll see you in five, and then we're going to turn on the video again. See you soon. Thank you.